folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchmen video broadcast. I'm, I'm going to use a little illustration here today. Uh, some people were asking me yesterday about some things that I had mentioned last week in the Watchmen video broadcast dealing with CERN, the horned god uh, of witchcraft. We're still dealing with the powers of witchcraft, but we're dealing with really the essence and the core of witchcraft and you're going to see why I spent so much time dealing with things like CERN and going backward in time and things like that. You're going to hopefully see that today, but I want to illustrate something for you. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, all right? This is, uh, of course, you know it's a cable. This is a VGA cable. I have surrounding me here in this room, I have probably a cable and a hookup thing for just about everything you can imagine, electronic or computer related, with the exception of what I need at any specific given time. Then I can never find that one, have to go to Radio Shack and get a new one. But I had this one laying around here. This is a, this is a monitor. This connects, you know, the computer to the monitor and feeds the information. But I want to use this kind of illustration here. This is, and let me turn it this way so it's all in the shot here. This is, this represents how you and I see time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Time has a beginning. And then Jesus comes down, Revelation 10 says, there should be time, no what? No longer. I can't make this cable longer. It won't, won't work that way. Uh, there is going to be an end, just like here, there's going to be an end of time. So this is the past, and for us, this right here represents the future, and we're not there yet, but we're, we're getting there, all right? And, you know, I could, you, we could use all this for all kinds of illustrations. Um, no matter where you are here on, on this time, whether no matter what part of history you're in, as a born-again Christian, this is where I want to be. I'm looking forward to the end. I'm looking forward to the My life has a beginning. The moment I was conceived, my life will have an end. This will be my death or the translation. One of the two doesn't matter to me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a beginning. I've had a beginning, and I'm going to have an end. And the Bible actually, Jesus actually said, I am the Alpha, the beginning, and the end. Jesus was saying, this is me, okay? He is uh, a, a representative of, of time, of God's word, of how God ordains everything. And you need to understand that the Bible has a beginning, the book has a beginning, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and it has an end, the book of Revelation, but at the end of the book of Revelation, we have um, a new heaven and a new earth, and the old heaven and the old earth, bound by linear time, is passed away, and there was no more sea. No more. Why did he say there was no more sea? I'm going to try to help explain that. These are big, big thoughts, way bigger than my head, but I think the Bible, I absolutely believe the Bible gives us enough clear things to look at in this world so that we get an idea of what it is. He said there is no more sea. So we know that the, the Bible has, be, has a beginning. Jesus is the Bible. He is the Word of God. And so Jesus is, watch this, the same yesterday, today, and even beyond this forever. I am the Lord. I change not. So here is all of human history, and God already sees it all at once. It's just like this cord here. I can look and I can see this whole cord here, and I can see every, that's why That's why when God gives a prophecy, it's because, let's say that Isaiah was here in the, in the timeline, but God can see here when Jesus was going to come along and see all the things that pertain to Christ and his ministry and his life here. So God can tell Isaiah, Isaiah, say this, this is going to happen. And Isaiah said it, and it happened. Go back before Isaiah. Here's David. 
that God says, David, say this, write this down. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's because God saw Christ here saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I hope that makes sense to everybody because this is what, this is what God sees. He sees all of human history and the Bible gives words like uh, uh, ordained, elect, predestined, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. God elected me to be in Christ from way back here. Why? Because God saw me. He sees the beginning of my life and he sees the end of my life. And in God's view, this is big stuff here, but in God's view, this is kind of what I think. I think God's got it all settled how it's going to be. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And God's word represents his ordinance and his governorship over all of time. Makes sense so far. I want you to just kind of think about that, all right? But let's, let's examine this from, oh, let's say we're going to read some verses here in a little bit. And I'm going to show you some symbols that might help you with this, all right? So, but let's look at it the way uh, the Bible talks about, and some things related to CERN smashing atoms into one another for they're trying to do something. And still, I don't understand all of it, but there are some things that I picked up on since last week. There's the reason why I'm doing this. Science believes that time is sort of like this. But science also believes, they have this idea that if you do certain things scientifically, like with a, a particle accelerator or something like that, the God particle, they think that time being straight like this can be warped. And they say that if you warp time enough, that you can bring the past into the present. So now, geometrically, instead of time being a straight line, here to there, time becomes a loop, a circle. It's going back on itself. Does the Bible and I'm, I'm going to show you a symbol that's going to match this. And you're going to see something, all right? I don't have the whole picture yet, so I can't give you the whole picture yet. But I'm looking. I'm, I'm, I'm watching what the scientists are doing, what the New Agers are saying, what the occultists are saying. I'm watching and looking with the glasses that God gives us from his word and I see that there is an attempt to do this. We, we brought that up last week. The idea of bringing something back from the past and bringing it around into the future. Well, that's what it looks like. And science is basically saying we have a theory that says if we can bend time kind of looks like a, a bow. What do you do with a bow? You bend it. Science says that if we can bend time, we can actually make a loop out of it and bring something from the past into the future or take something from the future and put it in the past. Remember all those verses last week that we dealt with people going backward, going backward, going backward. We're all sort of going like this, right? They want to do something with it. They want to change that. They want to make us go backward. Let's say here is Mount Sinai. Christ made an end of Mount Sinai. He ended the law at Calvary. They want to, the Jews, the Kabbalah Jews and everybody else, they want to keep going back to Mount Sinai. That's what that looks like. So let me show it to you. Remember, um, I'm going to leave this here. Probably going to need it here in a little bit. Remember, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old, first, old heaven and the old earth were passed away and there was what? No more sea. Why did he say that? Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. 
Then look at verse 9. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see this is new? It hath been already of old time which was before us. Now, I want you to think about that. Time is rendered in the scriptures as something like this. Think of, he mentioned the sun here. Think of what shape does the sun take? This, okay, it's not a square, okay? It's not a triangle, it's a circle. What, how does it travel? Does the sun go in a straight line? No, the Bible says Psalm 19, it travels in a circuit. We're gonna look at that. Um, and he mentioned the sea here. Here's a river, okay? A river always has a beginning, and a river runs into the sea. Now, the, we live by the Mississippi River. Mississippi River starts way up there in Minnesota, and it runs all the way down to Nolens, Louisiana, and it's, it kind of stops there, but it doesn't really. It turns into something else, turns into the sea. And what happens? The wind and the sun pick up the water from the sea and bring it back over the top and it runs down here to the river and it starts all over again. So he's showing you the cycle or the circle of time. He's showing you in the scriptures the loop. And he says in here that this basically is uh, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. There's something in the past that's going to be brought back to the future. And there it's mentioned right there in the scripture. And he mentioned the sea. So here's what God's going to do. This is kind of what I see from the scripture. At the end of time, God's going to stop the cycles. He's going to stop and end all the cycles. There's not going to be, um, the sea is a cycle and God's going to do away with the cycle and then it's just going to be a continuous, everlasting, eternal, always, always, always without time. That's about as good as I can explain it. I know these are big, big, big thoughts, but that's about as good as I can explain it. But that's what I believe is, is taking place right now, the cycle of time, the circle of time, and the, the, the idea that at the end of time, God's going to put a stop to it. He's going to sort of disconnect us or whatever. I don't know how to explain it other than that. But there's going to be an end of time. So, if you're utterly confused now, I'm sorry, I'm doing the best I can trying to explain this. But let me show you a symbol that describes, here they're going to warp time, they're going to bend time, and bring it into a loop back on itself. Let me show you what that symbol looks like. We've used this before. It's the symbol of the Ouroboros. So I want you to notice in this particular one, how many legs and feet does this dragon have? It's a, stop right here, it's a four-footed creature. Think about that. Think all the places in the Bible where it mentioned four-footed beasts. Four, why does it mention the number four? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, they have four. There are no three-legged beasts running around. They all have four. Why? They're an earthly representation of heavenly things, fourth dimension, fourth kingdom, as it were. So here we look at this Ouroboros, and here, watch this now, okay? And I, I, I've explained it this way because this is what I see, like in uh, Morals and Dogma and other places like that, Manly Hall. They talk about the Ouroboros, and Albert Pike, I think, is what is mentioned, that the tail represents the masculine. The open mouth represents the feminine. Okay, I get it. But think of it this way. Think of it as the female always represents what's on the earth, all right? Uh, the weaker part, the, the passive idea. The male always represents the active idea. You go back to Genesis 6 because this is, I'm looking at the Ouroboros, this is what the explanation that you get from these various sources is that it represents the male and the female, the sons of God and the daughters of men. Sons of God being the active part, daughters of men being the passive part, and the sons of God are going to, the, the strong iron is going to mingle with the weak, the clay. But where are these sons of God? They are 
back here. Genesis 6 happened way, 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 way back here. This is the future. What is the idea? Bring them back around. Bring the past into the future. Okay? I, I know this is getting big, but anyway, let's look at this. Let's look at what Manley Hall said about the Ouroboros. He said, the serpent with its tail in its mouth is the symbol for eternity. For in this position, the body of the reptile has neither beginning nor end. The head and tail represent the positive and negative poles of the cosmic life circuit. Did you see that? Circuit. The, the, the life, the cosmic life circuit of time being bended around that which is in the past coming around to that which is in the future, or for us, I guess it, at some point it's going to be the present future. Boy, this is getting really weird. Anyway, but that's, that's the idea. That's what that symbol represents. Um, he mentioned neither beginning nor end. That's a veiled reference to Christ. Okay? He was, he always was, is, and always shall be. Uh, positive and negative, think of North and South Pole, and ask the question, are some people saying, scientists saying, there's going to be a shift in the poles? North becoming South, South becoming, yeah. Think of New Age terms like a paradigm shift. Something so big and so phenomenal that it literally, I mean literally, changes everything on the planet. God has a plan for his people that we escape these things. It doesn't alter us. It doesn't change us. It doesn't, it doesn't deceive the very elect. But this happening here, that which was in that which shall be coming together, that happening is going to deceive everybody. I mentioned CERN last week, and I want you to look at this picture. Everything that CERN does is related to witchcraft, and I'm going to show you that. The location of CERN, Geneva, Switzerland, 46 degrees north. That number 46, you and I, we've talked about that, I don't know how many times. The 46 words that come out of Satan's mouth in Genesis chapter 3 in the King James Bible. The 46 words that they spoke in Genesis chapter 11, and they said, go to let us uh, make brick, go to let us build us a city and a tower. The 46 words there, uh, the temple being built 46 years, Jacob and Boaz, the two pillars, 23 cubits tall, a piece, 46. The house of the temple lodge, Washington, D.C., 33 columns on the bottom, 13 steps on the top, that's 46. Scottish Rite and York Rite of Freemasonry, 33 degrees Scottish Rite, 13 degrees York Rite, 46. I climbed the stairway going into the chamber of the uh, Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. 23 steps here, 23 steps here, 46 together. It has everything to do with humanity. The 46 chromosomes where our, DNA, where our seed is, they mingling themselves with the seed of men, and there are experiments going on in this magic circle that I believe, according to the scripture, has everything to do with opening something that is locked so that this can join with this. That's what I think is going on. Let's look at witchcraft. Witches make circles. That's what witches do. Anytime a witch, and you see these pictures here, I mean, these are just, I mean, these are just women that you see at the mall, women that go to the gas station, women that are living in the subdivision. These are just people next door to you and I that are performing ritualistic, satanic, portal opening witchcraft. They sit in circles and they say, you have to draw the circle and you have to make the circle right and the circle has to be right and you have to do this in the circle and that in the circle and be careful about going out of the circle because the circle is where you're protected and we're going to read all that. But it's all about circles, every bit of it. So think of, think of religions that have 
religions that have circles. The witchcraft of Islam. The witchcraft of Islam. Take a look at it. There it is. They're making a circle. What? Now, if you remember, few, several, I don't know, 100,000 Watchmen video broadcasts here back in the past, uh, I was dealing with um, uh, the idea of the number seven. And the idea that when you go to Mecca, if you are a Muslim, you go to Mecca, and you got to swirl in a circle around the idol of the Kaaba, even though the Muslims say it's not an idol, but it is their God, it's their holy place. They swirl, that black stone, remember that one? It's the opposite of the white stone that Jesus said he'll give to us for salvation. So here's the black stone, and they are swirling around it seven times, and, and Manley Hall said that what that is, it's a re representation of the seven bodily principles or the seven spirits, the seven heads of the Antichrist and so on that are swirling around the center point of the earth. That's what he said. This is a form of witchcraft. They're drawing circles and they say you, and this is, this is not just something, hey, let's do this for Allah. It's one of their things that in Islam, if you don't do it, you cannot go to paradise. You cannot have or be the 72 virgins. You can't do that. You'll go to hell in Islam if you don't make the swirl. If you don't make the circle, then the God that they're serving will not do for you. That is witchcraft at its core. Remember, witches make circles. Don't forget that. I got something I'm going to show you, some, something somebody sent me. Here are a few uh, examples of what witches believe about circles. When you want to do magic, you need to cast a circle. See how simple that is? The circle will protect you. This is from the Complete Idiot's Guide to Wiccan Witchcraft. Here's another one, Manley Hall, Secret Teachings of All Ages. The Druids, their temples, wherein the sacred fire was preserved, were generally situate on eminences and in dense groves of oak and assumed various forms, circular because a circle was the emblem of the universe. Here's another one from a, a, a website, The Pagan's Path. Most witches consider their spiritual space to be their magical circle. A magic circle is a space where a witch will conduct rituals and ceremonies. It is, look at here, look at the word. It is the gateway between worlds. Spiritual and physical realms come together and allow you to communicate with spirit, conduct spiritual work, rituals, ceremonies, and castings. Here's another one. The Encyclopedia of Witches, Witchcraft, and Wicca says a sacred and purified space in which rituals, magical work, and ceremonies are conducted. It offers a boundary for a reservoir of concentrated power and acts, take a look at it, acts as a doorway to the world of the gods. The circle is entered in anticipation of uniting with the gods and the forces of nature, which is earth, air, fire, and water, in a harmonious relationship. Here we go. Witchcraft, I mean, look at this. Witchcraft says, this is a door. We have to make the door. We have to get the door there. All right? You remember, you remember like on Bugs Bunny cartoons, okay? Uh, like uh, Wile E. Coyote or something like that. Wile E. Coyote would want the roadrunner to fall down in a hole, but there was no hole. So what would he do? He would draw a hole. And what would happen? He was supposed to, the roadrunner was supposed to fall in there. But he wouldn't. The roadrunner would pick the hole up and move it over here, and the coyote would fall in it. My dad used to just laugh and laugh over that. I'm going, yeah, this is hilarious. Okay? You can't have the door without the hole. So the witches and the Muslims and some churches are making the circle for the doorway. Got to bring the past into the future. Okay? Is this helping you? The circle is entered in anticipation. Here's us of uniting with the gods. Sons of God in the past, daughters of men in the future. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. All starting to make sense now, isn't it? Here's another one. Silver Ravenwood. This guy's a real witch, I can tell you. 
Okay? I cast the circle hedge. This is what she says. Now, I want you to, okay, I'm not giving you the whole thing. Witchcraft has everything to do with rituals and what they say. And according to witchcraft, if you don't say the whole thing, it won't work. That's why it's witchcraft, all right? I'm going to give you a little piece of a ritual they do just to show you what it is that they believe about the circle. I cast the circle hedge between the worlds. Be thou the girdle of the goddess and a protection against all negative energies. I call upon the positive spirits of the, let's count them, north, the east, the south, and the west to aid me in this consecration. We're dealing with the elements of wrath. One, two, three, four, earth, air, fire, and water, which are related to north, south, east, and west, which are the four directions which reference the spiritual underworld. And the goal of a witchcraft, or the goal of, of witchcraft, or the goal of a witch, or a Wiccan, or a wizard, is that you call upon these spirits to unite with you and join. See, it's witchcraft. It is sons of God, daughters of men. It is they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. God said in the prophecy, remember, because Nebuchadnezzar had the dream here of a time here. And because God sees all of this, he not only tells Daniel what's going to happen, but throughout the whole of the scriptures, you learn and understand because God sees it, and he's describing it for you here a little and there a little. He's telling you exactly not just what will happen, how it will happen. God knows that when this door is made, when this hole is drawn, when this circle is, is, is becomes complete, remember what Darth Vader said, the circle is become complete now because now he's facing off with Obi-Wan Kenobi. I remember that. You know what the force is? Witchcraft. It draws on the forces of nature to do the powers, okay? That's why you shouldn't get into Star, Star Wars, Star Trek either. So anyway, so the circle has to be made so that the doorway can be there so that these gods can unite with human beings. And God is explaining to us in the pages of the Bible, not just what will happen, how it will happen. So that, I'm going to show you what this is, so that if we see or hear this going on, we'll say, that's witchcraft. And I know it is. What do you find out what's on here? Whoops. <laughs> I undid my circle, all right? So anyway, that's, that's what witches believe. Now, I'm gonna, that's, that's all this over here. They could be lying through their teeth. Let's go to the authority of the Word of God to see this book I trust. These books, I've read them. I don't believe everything I read in here. This is what I believe. Let's look at how God shows us this idea of the cycle of time and what circles are all about. Isaiah 40 verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Let me ex explain that to you, okay? Here is, here is time, and God says time looks like this, and God says, I'm not in here. I'm not bound by this. I sit on it, which means that I rule over. When, when you sit on something, let's, when we used to play games as a kid, we'd wrestle. And when some kid ended up sitting on your head, he won. He's in charge. He rules over you. He's the king of the hill. When God sits on the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that means that God is bigger than us, and he rules over the circle. So no matter what amount of witchcraft takes place and how evil and bad the powers that be are, if God doesn't want it to happen, it doesn't happen. But all of this serves a purpose and part of the plan of Almighty God. I promise you it is. Job twenty-two fourteen, Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. 
Uh, Psalm 19.6, his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit under the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Proverbs 8.27, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Now, look at this, okay? Look at these, these things here. That God says the earth is a circle. He says the heavens are a circle. Stop and think about that. Stop and think about that. We have stars that... Do they sit still all year? No. They migrate. How? In a circle. And God is in the circuit of heaven. So he says, earth is a circle. He says, heaven is a circle. I'm going to show you a symbol here in a little bit. Earth is a circle. Heaven is a circle. The sun goes, of course, it is a circle in the sky. We, can only, we can't see that the sun is a ball, can we? No, we can't see that. We see it as a circle. And so, then he talks about the compass upon the face of the depth. He says, down here, in the deep, that's a circle too. Now, I'm going to show you a symbol of two circles coming together. Take a look at it. It is two circles coming together, and they fuse together, and they form a symbol that, that we've talked about. The mandorla and everything like it's a symbol of the sacred feminine, it's a symbol of rebirth, it's a symbol of all kinds of stuff, but it basically represents the two circles, the circle of the earth and the circle of the heavens or the circle of the underworld or whatever, colliding together, fusing together, the ancient and the future joining together. We talked about that last week. That's what um, Janus represents. Now watch this, because we mentioned the circle of the heavens, and I'm going to show you how this is related to time. You're going to see it from the pages of the Bible. Genesis 1, 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for, look at here, signs, number one, seasons, number two, days, number three, and years, number four. Four things here, four dimensions. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So right here, God is illustrating for us the, how things are in the universe, even the things that we can't see. We, we are just now learning how to see into vast distances of the universe, but what we're seeing is, is that these things in the sky, whether it's the circle of the sun, the circle of the moon, the little bitty circles of the stars, they all represent time. They shall be for signs, seasons, days, for years, um, winter, spring, summer, fall, and then what happens? Winter, spring, summer, fall, and then what happens? Winter, spring, summer, fall. Cyclical. Day unto day utter a speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. He's talking about the circle, and it all represents the circle of time. So when witches draw their circle, their idea is that they're opening up a portal, and they're making a loop. Think about that. Um... I don't know anything about weaving, but I think weaving involves at some point a loop or crochet or macrame or what, I don't know anything about them, but I think there's a loop in there somewhere, okay? Just kind of ponder that for a while. But anyway, that's what they're making. They're, he's saying the signs and the seasons and the days and the years and all of the terrestrial and celestial bodies are making a circle. They're making a loop. We have to make the loop so the doorway can be open. And he's telling you that this circle involves time. Look at 1 Samuel 7, 16. He went from, this is speaking of Samuel, he went from year to year in what? In circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. Think of Samuel being the word of God, the light of the world. Samuel is being is a picture of Christ who is the son of righteousness who arises with healing in his wings the son Psalm 19 goeth in a circuit Samuel why did the Bible use this particular language and specifically the way it did 
I believe the Bible is trying to describe for you the nature and the mechanics of the universe and of time that we live in. So what did you remember even in, in America in the old days when churches would rise up in these settlements but they couldn't, they couldn't really afford or couldn't find someone to pastor the church. So they had, and we used to sing this song, the circuit riding preacher, used to have these pastors that traveled around on horseback and went from one town to the other preaching meetings and then he would go in a circuit again. Just like the sun. Mm, beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. And think about, think about those villages. The preacher would come in, he'd preach his meetings there, and the light of God would shine on their life. But he would leave. And then what would happen? Darkness would set in. But then the preacher would come back around again and shine the light again. Just, just like out in the universe. This is so, I love talking about this because it's so real. We've seen it. We see it every day. But Samuel is like the word of God, the light of the world, and he go within a circuit, and it's specifically mentioned from year to year. And what I'm trying to do is I'm showing you the relationship in the Bible between this circle and time. And why are witches drawing circles? Here's another one. This is from Ecclesiastes again. This has to do with the wind. One generation passeth away, another generation cometh. Stop right here. The word gene is in the word generation. One genetics passes away, and another gene cometh. See it? One passes away, and one cometh. One is in the past. One seed is in the past. One seed is in the future. Let's bring them together, okay? Uh, the sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goes toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Let's back up on verse 6, and let's do some counting, because there's a pattern here. There's a rhythm. The wind goeth toward the south. That's one. Turneth about unto the north. That's two. It whirleth about continually. That's three. And the wind returneth again according to his circuits. That's four. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come, there that they return again. Do you see the number four there? The wind goeth toward the south, turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again to his circuits. And it's all about the fourth kingdom, fourth dimension, and time. And it's Solomon and the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. The preacher is who wrote Ecclesiastes. The words of the preacher. That was Jesus, by the way. Jesus is describing for us time and the circuits or the loop of time. It loops back. on. See, that's the idea. If we can bend time, we can make it loop back on itself. And something's going to happen when it does. So when I started thinking about all of this, I remembered that I have seen, and you probably have too, since H.G. Wells first wrote his book, The Time Machine, and I read it a long time ago. We've had one story after another, uh, short stories, long stories that I've read, science fiction. I used to love science fiction. Sci-fi movies that deal with time travel. The idea, the butterfly effect is one of them. Think of what a butterfly has. It has four wings, just like the four creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1. You see something there? That it's not just a random idea of what if. There is a spiritual connection to things that movies are projecting into the minds of people so that people will get it and people, let's say, you know what, let's make a circle and see what happens. All right, let's plug this into this and see what happens. Ugh. Anyway, so think about that. There is a movie, and it's called Looper. Look at the symbolism of the, of the graphics here. You see what looks like the number eight. That's the infinity symbol. By the way, the number eight, let me stop right here. The number eight is the number four 
recycled, new beginnings, new life. There's a verse in Scripture. I think I have it in my notes here. Let me see here. Let me check. Um, let me read it now while I'm thinking about it. Revelation chapter 17. We'll probably see it again here in a little bit. Revelation chapter 17 the beast that thou sawest, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. He, remember, he, he's, Christ was, is, shall be, the beast was, is not, and shall be. He is the eighth. So look at this idea of the looper again. That number eight, the symbol of, of uh, eternity, the symbol of um, infinity is what they call it. The symbol of uh, it keeps going and going and going. When we draw the number eight, where we started goes right back to where it ends. And it comes back around again and makes that twisted loop. That's what they're telling us that they're trying to do with the universe trying to make it wrap back on itself. And you study that infinity symbol in that number eight. But anyway, the number eight is the number for new beginnings. Watch this. On what day did God tell Abraham to circumcise his son? The eighth day. Why? New life and a new beginning. We have the seven days of the week, the Sabbath is the rest, and then the week starts all over again, which is the eighth day. Think of um, the 7,000 years of human history. Think of this, 7,000 years of human history, and think of um, the week and 6,000 years and the last 1,000 years being like the 1,000-year reign of Christ, and then God ends this right here. It has an end. And so what comes after the end is the eighth day, and that day lasts forever. But check this out. This, this story of Looper, let me just kind of give you the rundown of it. Look at the, look at the graphic here. This is uh, Bruce Willis and uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. The guy, Bruce Willis there on your left is facing one direction. Joseph Gordon-Levitt facing the other direction. By the way, they are supposed to be in the movie the same person. And... The guy in the future gets sent back into the past so he can be killed by the guy in the past, which is the guy in the future. It's like, uh, I don't, uh, it's kind of weird. And, but anyway, just look at the symbolism of it. They've made a loop. They're facing opposite directions. One is old. One is young. Face your past. Fight your future. Here's another movie called The Time Traveler's Wife. It's about a guy who travels back and forth in the circle of time. And he marries a wife. And they end up, uh, she's going to have a baby, but all of a sudden, now this guy, can he just randomly travels back and forth in time. He makes a baby with her. While she's pregnant, all of a sudden, the baby disappears. They said, this baby travels back and forth in time, too. Oh, no. So the guy, not wanting this to happen ever again, he's in this, he's at this part in time here, and this is where it gets weird. He goes and has surgery on himself, so he can't have any more babies. This is at this time here. But his wife ends up meeting her husband from the past, and now she's going to have the baby. It's, it's, think about this. Sons of God, daughters of men, and they had a baby. That was the mighty men of old, men of renown. The giants, the hybrids, that's who the Antichrist is. He's a hybrid. His father was from the past, coming into the future to make the loop so the baby could be born. There was a part of this movie where the time traveler goes back in the past to visit his mom who has died, but he's sitting there with her, talking to her in the past, and they're on a train called The Loop. That's what they're on. This imagery is it's trying to teach the masses the, the nature of the mystery so that the masses subconsciously absorb all of this in. It's about a loop, about a witch's circle. Here's a movie 
called Source Code. I saw this one time, and I'm just going, wow, that's, that's science fiction. But they're using a lot of terminology like the source. That's from the Kabbalah. The idea of the source is that mankind needs to return to the source. If you watch the Matrix movies, Neo is um, he's the one that needs to return back to the source. And so in the source code, they have a guy who's dead, but part of him is still alive. A little fragment of him is still alive. And they using him in a government program to go back in time. There was a train explosion, and there is the, the idea that a bigger bomb is going to go off, and they want him, the dead guy who's partially alive, to go back into the past, relive eight minutes. See it? Look at the picture here. To relive eight minutes so that he can figure out who the bomber is. He ends up doing more than that. This man who was dead and is just partially alive decides that he can not only find out who the bomber is by going through these eight minutes, this cycle. He keeps doing it over and over and over. And they say, go back in. <laughs> and he goes back into the source code. But then they figure out, then he figures out that he can actually change the outcome. And in the movie, he does. He alters the future. The bombs never go off. See, that's, see, God says, this is Christ, the beginning and the end, and it's the same, and it never changes. The devil says, I bet I can change everything. You remember Groundhog Day? Bill Murray, what was he doing? What was Bill Murray doing? He was going back in a circle and reliving February 2nd. You know what day that is on the calendar? January, half 31 days. 32 days is February the 1st. 33rd day is February the 2nd. 33, he's on the 33rd day of the year in a cycle reliving every single day until he alters the future. Until Bill Murray has a paradigm shift and now he's a different person and now the woman is in love with him. It's always, you see, at the end, you know what, all, you know what changes the future for Bill Murray who's going through this cycle? Being in bed with the woman. Sons of God, daughters of men. Mm -mm -mm. Let's look at a word now. We're, we're still dealing with witchcraft, the doorway, and the circle. Because when I started this, when I started this study, and I saw the, the primary influence that doing things in a circle had for witchcraft, I went and I read all these occult sources, these books on witchcraft. I kind of glanced. I didn't read the whole thing. I did a word search on them. And I found out what they said about circles and why they do it. But I'm not satisfied with that. That doesn't tell me why they're doing it. They just tell me that they are doing it. So now I wanted to find out from the Bible why they drew circles. Why that's so important to them. We get the idea of now they're going to, it's a door. What do you see at the mouth of a cave? A circle. What's in our mouth? A circle. By the way, the, you know what the Bible says about our mouth? It has doors. The doors of the lips, and the doors of the teeth. That's in Job uh, 40 or 41, talking about Leviathan. The doors must be opened so the speech can come out. Big stuff there. I'm not even ready to talk about that yet. But anyway, the circle has to be drawn. The door has to be opened. And what is the significance of the surrounding of that circle? 2 Samuel 22, 5. When the waves of death can pass me. Let, i got to stop right here. I'm trying to, trying to take as much time as I can to explain everything that I see happening so that you understand the, that the language of the Bible is, is absolutely phenomenal. When I tell you that this King James Bible is the accurate representation of everything in the universe... The more I look at it, the more I just, I'm stunned. Something about what they're doing in the magic circle at CERN, you know, named after the horn god, 
of witchcraft. Some, something related to the physics of, and the witchcraft of physics that they're doing at CERN has to do with particles and waves. Because there's a certain substance, I, can't, I think it's photons, which are little things of light. They say that photons, I don't really understand this, actually exist as particles and as waves at the same time. I don't, I don't know what that is, but look at the word waves in the King James Bible. Look at this one. When the waves of death, think of spirits, all right? Think of devils. Think of Revelation 9. When the waves of death compassed me, what did they do? They enclosed him in a circle. The floods, think of as the days of Noah, of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Witches draw circles. Where do they get their power from? The waves of ungodly men and the sorrows of hell is where they get their power. They're getting their power from hell. Not heaven. That's obvious. Now you can see it. 1 Samuel 23, 26. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain, and David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. So think of our enemies. Think of all these people over here. And they are our enemies. And they are surrounding us because they want to open that portal and destroy everything that is of God. That's what you're getting from the scriptures. Genesis 19.4 But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round. See the words there? Compassed the house round. They made a circle. Look at here. Both old and young and all the people from every quarter. I, I looked at this and I'm just going... That is absolutely amazing that the men of Sodom, wickedness, ungodly men, they made a circle around Lot's house, and the, the, the old and the young made a circle around Lot's house, and they came from every what? Quarter. Four quarters. They came from all four... <laughs> Just, this Bible is absolutely stunning. Judges 16, 2, and it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither, and they compassed him in. They drew a circle around him and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. The circle has a gate, by the way. And were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. Look at the, the idea of the, the Philistines. From, from, uh, from Gaza, they were circling, they made a circle around Samson. It was night, now it's going to be day because of the circle and the cycle. Um, and they're going to try to kill Christ, who is Samson. Samson is a picture of Jesus Christ. He's a picture of the Savior. He's a picture of the Judge. That's the goal of witchcraft. Witchcraft kills the Word. Think about that. Psalm 17, 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me from, the deadly, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like as a lion that is greedy of his prey and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Now look at Psalm 22. Many bulls, think of beasts, have compassed me. They made a circle around me. Bulls and Baal. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. See the word there. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. 
This is a prophecy of Christ on the cross. And what is the Bible which gives us the ability to look into the fourth dimension, the spiritual realm? What does the Bible say? We dealt with this, um, uh, we've dealt with astrology before, but I talked about what the zodiac was. You know what the zodiac is? Zoa means living creatures or beasts. A zoo is where we keep the zoas. It's where we keep the beasts. And zodiac mean, literally means, take a look at this, it's a circle of beasts. Christ was compassed about by the beast on the day that he was killed. When I tell you that witchcraft has one goal, and that is to destroy and devour the Word of God. Believe me. Believe, believe the Word of God. Because witchcraft is moving into the churches very subtly. No preacher ever stands up and says, uh, Today we're going to draw a circle and cast spells on, on all the King James only people. They don't do that. They don't get up and say, Now... We, we here at uh, First uh, Church of the So-and-So, we worship the horned god and the goddess. They don't do that. The serpent never does that. He's very subtle in what he does. Very subtle. But I'm telling you, it's moving in, and it has one goal in mind, and that is to destroy the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and everybody associated with him. Look at Psalm 140, verse 8. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, further not his wicked device. That I think the wicked device would be anything the devil used, like a circle, lest they exalt themselves. Selah. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into what? Deep pits that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. He's equating those that compass him and, his, and the enemies. They, God, he said, throw them in a pit, God, so they never come back up here. And he said, it's the evil speaker. Remember I told you that, and we, we always say this, where did he go? He went in the mouth of that cave. I'm going to show you verses. Our mouth is a circle. Our mouth has two doorways. One of them is the door of our lips, that's in the Bible, and the door of our teeth. And so the idea is, is that the evil speaker is going to rise up out of, we have a pit here, don't we? It's going to rise up out of the pit. Think of what food does. When it, what is that? What did the whale do? Mm, 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 mm. Star Trek 4. The Enterprise, Earth is going to be destroyed. And the Enterprise goes back in time because the future Earth has no whales. And there's an alien probe trying to contact the whales. So the Enterprise goes back in time, gets whales from the past, and circles the sun and brings them back into the future, and the whales save the earth. Yeah. I get it. I absolutely get it. Okay? Or I'm getting it. But you see the idea. The idea is that the evil speaker, he's the, he's the lost word of Freemasonry. Here we have... The, the, the preacher, Jesus Christ, we have the lost word of Freemasonry, that's the evil speaker, and they want to compass mankind so the evil speaker can come out. Think of the door of your lips and why, uh, Lord, keep the door of my lips. What did, what did James say about our tongue, which is inside the door? Don't let it out. It's evil. It'll set the whole world on fire. It's a spark that if we, s witchcraft is, say the right things. That's witchcraft. And we let the evil speaker come out of us because the doors were open. Sometimes we just need to keep our mouth shut 
and not say things because once we say words, they don't go away, do they? Whew. Well, this Bible's deep and it's right. Now look at this. Joshua 6.15. And it came to pass on the seventh day. Notice the time here. The word day is a time. Came to pass on the seventh day. Think of 7,000 years. That they rose early about the dawning of the day. That's a cycle. And compassed, there's a circle, the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. Think of how we see the word times in the Bible. A time, times, dividing of times. It's a reference to the, this span of time. And Joshua and the Israelites circled. They made a compass of six days. And then on the seventh day, seven times and Jericho, which is Babylon the Great, it fell, and what happened after that? Rahab, the harlot, got a new life. It's a, it's a picture of what's going to happen in the future, and the devil wants to try to alter that. Just keep that in mind. 2 Kings 5.14 then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. This is um, Naaman. This is Naaman. Uh, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. What happened? What happened to Naaman? What did Naaman do? He went in the water, the river, which is a cycle. It runs into the sea and comes back and starts all over again. He goes into the river, and what does he do? He cycles seven times. And when he cycles seven times, after the seventh time, what happens? Naaman has a new beginning because his flesh turns back into the flesh of a child. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of what? Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Man, this is so... Even if you don't... And don't think that I just get all of this and I have this perfect knowledge of it. I don't. But that's the beauty of it. When I look inside this Bible, I see these things now and, they're, and we're just going... That Bible is amazing. And, and I mentioned last week, you know, you'll probably have to watch this three or four times to really get it. I'm probably going to have to go. I keep going back over my notes and over and over again. I keep cycling. Why? To renew my mind and refresh my memory so that I can grasp more of what this is teaching. So if you don't get it all, don't feel bad. Trust me, I don't either. But I believe what this book is trying to tell us. Isaiah 50 verse 11. Behold, all ye that do what? Kindle the fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks that ye have kindled, this shall ye have of mine hand, and ye shall lie down in sorrow. Do you see that? Witches draw circles, and sometimes they make those circles out of fire. And he mentions kindling a fire and the divine spark. And he said, you do that. Go ahead. You're going to lay down in sorrow. Witchcraft does not bring the satisfaction of life. It brings death. And that's what he's describing here. Now, keep mentioning the word compass, all right? The word compass. Think of navigation. What is this? It's referred to as a rose compass. And it's divided north, south, east, and west, the four cardinal directions representing the spiritual realm, and a rose compass is in a what? It's in a circle. What is the earth? It's a circle. When they talk about, uh, who was it, Magellan? The first to do what? Make the circle. Circumnavigate the earth. So think of what he did. He drew a circle. How did he do that? At some point, at some point, navigators figured out exactly what God told them. That navigation could be done based upon the signs, the seasons, the days, and the years. Navigation and moving in the circle of the earth, going from point A to point B, is done, and it doesn't matter how far you travel, you're still walking on the circle of the earth. And navigation is based upon how did they do it? When they started drawing the lines of longitude and latitude on the earth, they divided it in degrees, 360 degrees, but then in the sub-degrees, 
let's say uh, uh, like, like this, 46 degrees north latitude, that's where CERN is. It matches the chromosomes, human body. That's where the witchcraft is taking place. So 46 degrees north latitude, but it's not quite exactly on the 46 degrees north latitude. It is at 46 degrees, I'm just making this up here, 46 degrees, 1 hour, 12 minutes, 22 seconds. When they use a compass to navigate from here to there, it is related to time. Navigation is related to, so that's why they had this idea of what's called time travel. Now, who uses, this is a, it's a trivia question here, who uses a compass as one of their main symbols? If you answer correctly, you get a free video from Prophetic Research Ministry. Everybody does, even if you get it wrong. Who does that? Masons. How do we, on earth, when we're plotting something out, how do we draw a circle, a perfect one? We use a, I've been using a compass since grade school. They teach you how to use a compass. and Boy, didn't we always want to stab somebody with it. Remember? Okay? But we use a compass. What is the main symbol of Freemasonry? The compass. What does it mean? It means drawing a circle. They call it circumscribing. A mason is to circumscribe his life with his ethics and his morals and blah, blah, blah. And they make all that stuff up and they're lying through their teeth. Notice what the Bible says. Isaiah 44, 13. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. That's number two. He fitteth it with planes. Number three. And he marketh it out with the compass. Number four. And maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. Think of the house. That's the house. The house is the temple. What are they doing here in Isaiah 44, 13? Making an image of the beast. Remember Revelation 13 says the false prophet, witchcraft, is going to cause everybody on the earth to make an image of the beast. Remember, God is not only telling you what's going to happen, he's describing for us how it happens. And so he says the carpenters. By the way, take a look at the Carpenter Union's logo. Just Google that. Tell me what you see. All right? I'll let you do it. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule, number one. Marketh it with a line, number two. Fitteth it with planes, number three. Marketh it out with a compass, number four. You know, the, you know what God's saying? The carpenters who are going to build the image have to draw the circle and they have to use the compass in order to get it done. And by the way, you stretch out a rule. Masons have a 24-gauge rule. Mark it with a line. They use the, they use the plummet. Uh, fit it with planes. You know what that is? That's the square. And they draw it with a compass. The square and the compass a Freemasonry is all about witchcraft and performing the ritual so we can draw the circle, so we can open the portal, so the door will open and the evil speaker will come out. What this this Bible, I love it. I love I love going through this. Lamentations three. Remember, uh, let me stop right here. We I was reading this one time and it occurred to me. I think this is a picture of the Antichrist. I think this is him down there. Do you remember, you remember Shiva from last week's video? Uh, Lindsay, we can put, Lindsay's my producer. She's my daughter. Lindsay put a picture of Shiva up there surrounded in a circle of flames. Shiva, and someone mentioned to me from that picture, Pastor Mike, did you notice? that Shiva casts a shadow. The light is such that Shiva, the statue of Shiva, casts a shadow on the building of CERN. The idea of a shadow has everything to do. A shadow is a lesser dimension idea of a higher dimension reality. Okay, just like my hand is three dimensions, but my shadow is two. Very good, very good watchful eye. Whoever sent that to me, I, I don't remember, but anyway... 
Shiva, the destroyer, is in a circle of flames. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 4. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. Think, look at the language. It's time past. He hath broken my bones. He hath built it against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be uh, dead of old. He hath hedged me about that, and I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. Think of those languages, right? Think, think of the words. He, he hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone and made my paths crooked. They're not straight. How does a snake travel? He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. That's the beast. He's cut in pieces. Leviathan is broken pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He bent his bow. I think that bow has a lot to, because they keep talking about they're going to bend something that's straight, which is time. They're going to bend it and make it come out. He, bent, he hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. What do people get on the right, right hand and their forehead? The mark. Okay, so watch this. I want to go back to this. He, was, um, uh, he hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone and made my paths crooked. Get ready. We've talked about this before. Here's a circle. Here is the hybrid, the half man, half beast. And he is enclosed in a stone circle. And the path to get out of there is crooked. It's not straight. So think about I mentioned this a while ago. Our mouth has a doorway, has two doors to it, and our stomach is a pit. And from our stomach to our bowels, what does it look like? That's what our bowels look like. They're not in a straight line. Think about the bowels of the earth. Think about the depths here. Think about, uh, let me just say this. Think, use, let me use the illustration of what goes in comes out. And we're not defiled by what goes in because we eat good things. What defiles us? What's unclean that comes out of us because it was in the bowels. Just ponder these things so you get the depth of what God is trying to teach you here. Okay, he's, he's, my, my paths are not straight, he said. That means they're crooked. So here he is in this labyrinth. A crooked path that goes all the way to the center where this beast man is enclosed and he wants out, but he can't get out. So the teaching is that somebody has got to walk the crooked path to get down in there to let him out. The door has to be opened. The circle has to be made. So we can go to the center point and bring him out. Yeah, you've seen it. Churches are building and drawing circles. That's what they're doing. Churches are drawing circles and they're telling you this is worship. This is if you do this, if you perform. Let me read you this. Walking the prayer labyrinth. This is White's Chapel Church. You are entering holy ground. Prepare your heart as you approach the entrance. The labyrinth represents our spiritual journey. And it's crooked. Pick up a stone that will... Look at this. Pick up a stone that will represent the burden you are taking to Christ. Where's Christ, by the way? He's, he's in the center. As you enter from the world, you begin your path towards the center, Christ. You cannot get lost in the labyrinth. You always move forward. As you approach the center, you approach the presence of Christ. Feel free to pause, to kneel, to reflect on your journey. Leave your stone in the center. When you are ready, pick up another stone representing the burdens we carry for those who have come before us to the labyrinth. Turn and retrace your steps back through the labyrinth. 
as you leave the labyrinth, leave your stone, burdens behind you, are ready to enter the world with the presence of Christ with you. Are you kidding me? When you get to the center, there's a stone there. Pick it up and take it with you. Take it out. Which craft being performed in the church? What is sad to, and what is the purpose of witchcraft? It's to let open up the gate and open the portal so that stone can come out and that stone is going to try to destroy the Word of God. Wow. Here's another example of that from the scriptures. Jonah. Then Jonah prayed unto... By the way, stop right here. Where was Jonah? What beast was he in? Star Trek 4. Go back in time. Bring the whales. Bring them forward in time. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about all thy billows, and thy waves passed over me. Remember, photons are particles, and yet they are waves as well. Here is another quote from the Encyclopedia of Witches, Witch, Witchcraft, and Wicca, a sacred and purified space in which rituals, magical work, and ceremonies are conducted. It offers a boundary for a reservoir of concentrated power and acts as a doorway to the world of the gods. The circle is entered in anticipation of uniting with the gods and forces of nature, earth, air, fire, and water, in a harmonious relationship. Now, we read that earlier, but I want you to, uh, now that we've studied the scriptures, we can see exactly, we know exactly what they're talking about. They want you to open a doorway between you and, and where? hell why because there's a force down there a power that needs to rise up and come out and take over the world that's what the the purpose and the goal of witchcraft is to get that door opened what are they doing at the circle of CERN. They're performing physics based witchcraft. It's the same thing, whether there is a scientific thing to it or not. It is witchcraft because they're trying to get the door to the past open to alter the future. They call it, we gotta save the planet. I'm not buying it. Look at the name. Look at it, 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 you know here here that CERN has this image of the beast in front of it, casting a shadow in the building. I get it. So already we see the spiritual witchcraft antichrist connection to it. But then look at here. Here's what they called some of their other programs: Atlas, Alice. What does that have to do with like Alice's restaurant or whatever? No. Atlas is the demigod who keeps the heavens from colliding with the earth. See it? The Large Hadron Collider has, the circle of the Large Hadron Collider has one function. That is to collide the opposites. And they named it after Atlas. Because Atlas bears the responsibility. By the way, remember the Man of Steel? He's Atlas. Okay? Go back and watch that. Or no, Superman Returns, that's where it shows up in. He's Atlas. He's holding the earth. But Atlas's job is the demigod. He is half human, half God, who keeps the heaven colliding with the earth. So the two circles don't fuse together. And they're looking for the God particle. You remember Alice. Alice where? Alice's adventures in the looking glass. Remember, Charles Dodgson a minister who was also a mathematician who wrote under the name Lewis Carroll. And in drawing and writing out the theories of the fourth dimension, he does so under the guise of Alice going through a mirror, like a thing of reflective water, 
going through a mirror into the sea circle, a mirror is a circle, going into a portal of the fourth dimension. That's what he was, and that's why they named that Alice, because it represents a portal to the fourth dimension. Here are some articles. In case you think, Hoggy, you're making this up. I think you need to have some coffee and take a break for a while. Here are some articles. These are articles that you sent me. Pastor, look at what's going on in the world. Look at this one. Could Higgs particle be a time-traveling assassin? We've heard the story. A time-traveler goes back in time, killing his grandfather. The upshot is that the time-traveler ceases to exist. If the time-traveler doesn't exist, how could he have traveled back in time to kill his grandfather? This logical paradox is known as the grandfather paradox, and although it makes for a great science fiction storyline, it is a perplexing conundrum that is physicists scratching their heads. If it is possible to travel back in time, wouldn't that cause a tangle in time? If in the future something is sent to a date in the past, shouldn't we already see it? How does the universe prevent such paradoxes from occurring? It doesn't. How can we exist at all? Enter the Large Hadron Collider, a particle accelerator that might become mankind's first time machine, thereby helping us find out if we can kill our grandfathers in the past and still exist, or something like that. Time machine is a very loose term in this case, as you could actually use it to transport yourself through time. Although there is a wormhole, large hadron collider, time traveling theory that disagrees with this point. But the LHC might generate a type of Higgs particle that cuts through time like a hot knife through butter, and it's de and it's, i got to stop right here. It cuts through time. Remember what God said about the beast in Daniel, that he shall seek to change times and laws, and they will be given into his hand. And so what does he do? He goes for a time, times, and what? A dividing of time. And the Large Hadron Collider cuts through time. Or that's the theory, anyway. Uh, so the, the generate a type of Higgs particle that cuts through time like a hot knife through butter, and, it de and its decay particles appear in our universe before its own creation event. This theory has been formulated by two Vanderbilt University theoretical physicists, Tom Weller and and Chu Man Ho, starting, stating the obvious, Weller said that the theory is, quote, a long shot, but it doesn't violate any of the laws of physics. Here's another article. Scientists believe they're one step closer to creating time travel. American physicists from Vanderbilt University believe they may be able to use the Large Hadron Collider, the world's biggest atom smasher buried underground near Geneva, to send a type of matter called the Higgs singlet into the past. The Higgs singlet may be able to jump through space and time, travel through a hidden dimension, and then re-enter our dimension forward or backward in time but they're unsure if the Higgs singlet actually exists and whether the machine can produce it according to a report by Live Science. The Higgs singlet is re related to another hypothesized particle called the Higgs boson, dubbed God's particle because it is associated with giving other particles mass which the 27 kilometer long atom smasher may produce. If the Higgs boson is created, the Higgs singlet may also appear, scientists say. The Higgs singlet may be able to jump through space and time, travel through a hidden dimension, and then re-enter our dimension forwards or backwards in time, Prof physics professor Thomas Whaler and graduate fellow Chu Man Ho believe. One of the attractive things about this approach to time travel is that it avoids all the big paradoxes, Professor Whaler said in a statement and research website. Uh, because time travel is limited to these special particles, it is not possible for a man to travel back in time and murder one of his parents before he himself is born, for example. However, if scientists could control the production of Higgs singlets, they might be able to send messages to the past or future. Now, whew, essentially, the theoretic physicists are saying it is possible that this particle, what they call a singlet. I learned something. You remember, you know what the Big Bang Theory is all about. The Big Bang Theory says that, that all of mass and all of matter in the universe, including you and I, 14 billion years ago, was in this very hot, dense, um, the whole universe was in a hot, dense state. You know that song, okay? Anyway, it was in this very small, hot, dense thing called 
the singularity. In other words, the universe was singular at one time. A reaction took place and blew the singularity out in pieces. Remember what Lamentation said, I am broken in pieces? Remember what Rahab is? He was cut in pieces and scattered all over the universe. You know what the, the goal of the, the quant, quantum, quantum spirituality, quantum mechanics and quantum physics is exactly the science of connecting the loop. Leonard Sweet, New Ager, Rick Warren's buddy. The whole goal of the Aquarian conspiracy is to bring about the singularity. Bringing the pieces all back together again like they were in the origin, the past, the singularity. That's all the nations and all the peoples becoming one again like at the Tower of Babel. And God himself is the one who scattered them everywhere. Let's bring them back so we can have the singularity. The, he, the Higgs singlet has something to do with that idea, bringing the past into the future. Stargate. It's a movie, right? TV show, several TV shows. I watched the movie once. Uh, I kind of watched the TV show a few times. I kind of got the idea of it. But what was it they found? They found, the United States military found a circle. Take a look at it. They found a circle. Look at what it looks like. Remember, if you've seen the movie or seen the TV show, it was always like the image of water. When you went into the circle, you were going through a portal of the sea. Where does Revelation 13 say the beast comes out of? The sea. He rises out of the He's coming through the portal, the door. And I want you to look at this. The Stargate, whoever designed this science fiction, it's not real. That's like the government doesn't really do that. No, you're right. The government of the United States, I don't think, is alone in this. Just recently, people notified me, Pastor Mike, did you see this? CERN now raised the flag of Israel, which is a triangle pointed down, fused with a triangle pointed up. The flag of Israel has now been, it's the number six, has now been raised as one of the member nations of CERN. It's not just one government. It's the whole world joining together to get this door open. But whoever, take a look at the Stargate symbol again. Whoever, and look at that pyramid there. We saw, we know what that is. It has four sides. It's a, it's a fourth dimension flame is what it is. They're, they're telling you that they're opening a doorway to where? Where the four dimension flames are. Where Shiva is doing this little hot coal dance because he's on fire. That's why he's dancing. <sighs> anyway, it's all about opening that doorway to hell. That's what, that's what Stargate is. And whoever designed this gate, number one, new witchcraft, circle. Or let's say that the spirit of this world working in the children of disobedience guided whoever designed this. Because I'm going to show you something. I want you to notice on this Stargate. Take a look at the circle that they made for this TV show. There are ten points on this circle. And, each, and if, you, if you've watched the show or the movie, and if you haven't, don't worry about it. Whoever designed this Stargate knew exactly what they were doing. They were making a circle as a portal with the sea, and there was a divine flame on the other side of that, and something, if you remember the first time they opened it, they had all these guys you know, with guns, you know, we, we don't know what's going to come out of there, so get ready to shoot! Because they knew something was going to come through that, and they call it a wormhole. By the way, I think that I found wormholes in my King James Bible. I'll let you see if you can find it too. That's, but that's, they say if they can bend time, they create what's called a wormhole that goes from this dimension to the other dimension, and whatever's in that dimension can come through to here. It's all about witchcraft.
Take a look at the Large Hadron Collider. It is a circle. By the way, and it's divided up. Look at these pipes here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that matches perfectly. Remember, we started this out talking about the, uh, the God who is not really an, an intelligent entity, but this God who is the unknowable God with the ineffable name. You think about that. You think about the God whose name we cannot pronounce. And I'm not talking about the God of this Bible either. But the Tau symbol is a portal divided up into eight sections with the yin and the yang, the positive and negative, joined together at the center. So this CERN thing, not only is this circle witchcraft, but it's got this Tau idea and this Tau mentality that they're opening up a portal so that the infinite can rise up out of it. These people are being led. The God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, is the spirit that is working in the children of disobedience that are trying to open up this portal. Let me show you this. In Revelation, I already talked about this, number 8. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Think of the law, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are, are called and chosen and faithful. Now, I want to I reassert this very quickly, and I want to show you something. And we're going to close with this. I know it's been a lot of time here, but I want you to get where I'm going. Because the goal of witchcraft is to destroy the Word of God, is to destroy Christ. We've got to open up, got to draw the circle, open up the portal. But witchcraft says we've got to do everything exactly perfect. If you, draw this, if you don't draw the circle right, witches even say if, there's a, if you draw the circle and it's not complete, stuff's going to come in and get you. You have to make it perfect. You have to do everything just the right way. You have to do this. You cannot, you cannot do witchcraft without the circle. You just can't do it. I want you to ponder this. The law in the Old Testament was exactly that way. Now, I'm not speaking ill of the law. I love the law. The law Paul said every time I break the law, I consent that it's good. But here's the, here's the thing with the law. God said in the law, do everything perfectly and exactly the way I do it and the way I tell you. And James said, if a man offend the law in one point, he's guilty of all. In witchcraft, if you say or do something wrong, not according to the ritual, not according to the rules, the power won't work and the portal will not be released. The portal will not be opened. That's the law. That was the contract that God gave them. Do everything I said, and I'll give you life. No one has ever done that except one, Christ. So Christ, the Bible, the Bible says, is the end of the law for all men. So it has an end. So witchcraft is sort of based upon the principle of the law. Witchcraft, the devil's religion, says do, and we'll open the portal, and we'll get this guy out of here, and he'll control everybody, and you'll get his mark, and give you immortality. Think about it. That's what the, the devil promised with his 46 words in the Garden of Eden. You shall not surely die, but you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. God wrote a new, con a new contract. He sent his mediator down to the earth, and he sealed it with his blood. It's a blood covenant. And that covenant says, believe. 
Trust me. And you'll live. You don't do everything right, I got it covered. You don't say everything right, Paul said, for we don't even know what to ask or think. The Holy Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what to pray. God is able to do above and exceeding more than we're able to even ask or think. That's Bible Christianity. Bible Christianity requires no church building. It requires no rituals. It requires no work of man's flesh or his body or his mouth in order to have it. Simply believe. You do ask. I believe that absolutely. But it's as simple as God save me. The thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See how simple that was? He was believing that Jesus was going to live even past his death. So the Bible says, if we confess with our mouth, the Lord, what did he say? Lord, Jesus Christ, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The thief on the cross believed Jesus was going to raise from the dead. Even before he died, he believed it. And Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's how simple it is. But people come along. And they make it hard. So they tell you, let's draw a circle here. Let's walk through the bowels of the labyrinth in, a, in an unstraight path, in a crooked path. And you must do this. You must pick up this stone and put it in there. Then you must pick up a stone and bring it out. And then God will bless you. Several of you have written to me about a book that's come out. It is, it's taking over. It's called The Circle Maker. It is based upon not the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Something, a Jewish tradition that was written between the Old and the New Testament. About a guy named Honey, who in a time of drought said that he drew a circle and he stepped in it and he declared, he prayed to a God. Who did he pray to? I'm going to show you who he prayed to. It wasn't the God of this Bible. He drew a circle and he stood there and he said, I am not going to come out until you make it rain. What is rain? It's God opening the portals of heaven. Think about it. So it rained a little bit and he said, God, it's not enough. I want more. And he stood there and he stood there. But that's, this guy, this preacher, wrote a book about a different gospel that's not in this book. He brought another gospel. He brought a gospel of witchcraft that says, if you perform, God will bless you. And you get this book and you start reading it. It's all, it's all about, now draw a circle around this. Now draw a circle around that. I draw circles around this and God blesses me. I, I get inside the circle. I make the loop. And God opens up the doors and does all these things for me. But he wasn't praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was not praying to the God whose name is I Am, Jehovah, Jesus Christ, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. No, no, no. From the book, The Circle Maker, this is what, what is his name? Mark Batterson. This is who he said Honey was praying to. Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. You know what? I just had a funny feeling about that one. So I searched the King James Bible for the Lord of the universe. It's not in there. That's not one of his names. This man was praying to a God whose name is the Lord of the universe. You know who that is? Take a look. It's Shiva who stands inside the circle. You say, well, that, you know, them churches do that. Somebody sent me this. I don't know who did it. It showed up on my desk. It probably came with a letter, and I haven't read the letter yet. But I came downstairs one day, and this was on my desk, and I started looking at it. What this is, this is a sermon from some church, some guy,
who I guarantee you he copied and pasted this sermon off the internet. Guarantee you. Whoever preached this didn't write this. And I have proof. So, and I've seen this before. These guys buy or steal their sermons from the internet so they can spend all week playing golf or playing video games or doing other stuff on their computer. Just saying. But they don't study the Word of God. They, if I wasn't right with God, that's what I would do. So I'm looking at this, and I'm just going, yeah, that he's, yeah, he's quoting from the New Living Translation, the NIV, the message. And then I saw a word on here called, part of his sermon outline, Quail Mageddon. And he's quoting from Numbers 11.31, the NIV. And I went, Quail Mageddon? What is that? This sermon is all, of it. the sermon is called, Is There a Limit to My Power? And Numbers 11.23 from the Good News Translation. Quail Mageddon. What is that? Google it. Quail Mageddon is a phrase and a concept from the circle maker. If you draw the circle and get in it, then you'll have power. That's what witches do. And this, this, witchcraft, is destroying this in that church. Colossians 2.8, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beware. Because the witchcraft is everywhere. The witchcraft has circled us and compassed us about to destroy us. Just like a snake. Well, you know what a snake does? Constricts in a circle. Why? To destroy its victim. The dragon stood before the woman to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's what witchcraft is. I hate it. I am the enemy. I'm the enemy of this. I'm the enemy of the circle maker guy and his philosophy and his rudiments and his vain traditions and his Jewish traditions. I'm an enemy of that. This stuff is an enemy of me, I guarantee you. Because I think God's people should be free and not compassed about and restricted by the dragon. I think we should be free. Any man who is free in Christ, he is free indeed. And God is not requiring you to draw the circle or say the magic words or do this or do that. He's requiring you to trust this book. But wherever this is, this seeks to devour that, so you can't believe it and won't. A lot of stuff here. A lot of stuff here. Go back and think about these things. Th search out through the scriptures some of these things that I've given you, some of these ideas. See if you can find wormholes in the Bible. Okay, see if you can find it in there. I, I found it. I don't know exactly what it means yet, but it's in there. Anyway, I want to leave you be. God bless you. We're going to continue our study in witchcraft, the elements of power. We're going to take it in different directions, different places, according to the Word of God. You pray for us. The devil, how do you know you, how do you, know you walk close to a beehive? The bees let you know, and the bees have let us know. So you pray for us, all right? God bless you. We love you. You're the reason why we do this. We love the kingdom of God. We love the word of God. And we love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.